أفلح من صلى على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من شر الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لترى بمقدمه الفداء Amma Bad, respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the past few nights, we've started to discuss Ali ibn Abi Talib's position from the Prophet of Islam, in which two nights ago we discussed his position in reference to the brotherhood, his position in reference to the hadith known as Hadith al-Manzil, in which he says, you are to me, O Ali, like Aaron, or Harun is to Musa, except that there's no Prophet after me. And we analyze the aspect of brotherhood between the Prophet of Islam and Ali ibn Abi Talib. And yesterday we completed that in which we looked into the concept and the story of al-Mubahala in which we gained knowledge and gained insight of where the Prophet of Islam goes a step further from calling Ali ibn Abi Talib his brother and he calls him, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reference to the Qur'an calls him the Prophet's own self. Now tonight as promised we'll discuss Ali ibn Abi Talib's knowledge, Ali ibn Abi Talib's power. And when I say power it's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted into Ali ibn Abi Talib. In reference to the hadith that we stated yesterday. Inshallah, we'll start off with that hadith today. Then we'll go on to discuss Ali ibn Abi Talib in comparison with the other prophets of Islam. And in conclusion, we'll look, look at something that's not many people look at. Something that is of the utmost importance and the utmost power when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to someone. And that's Allah's greatest name. We'll look at the letters. How much does Allah's greatest name consist of? What are these letters? Who are given these letters? How many have these people throughout history been given? Then we'd look at a final account. Who is given knowledge from the Quran? What is he capable of? And who is the one that's given knowledge of the book? Remember, first and foremost, part of the book and what he's capable of. And the other person, knowledge of the book and what he's capable of. And inshallah, we'll conclude for tonight and we'll remain in the aspect and the idea of Ali ibn Abi Talib in the upcoming nights. So please help me in, in starting tonight by reciting aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <laughs> to start off, I will mention the hadith we mentioned yesterday. It will be a repetition, but it's a refreshment. When we look at the secret within Ali ibn Abi Talib, where the Prophet of Islam states about Ali, and it's found in many different masadir, where you find the Prophet says about Ali, if I was not afraid, or if I was not afraid that the people, or my people will say about you what the Christians said about Jesus, son of Mary. So the Prophet of Islam is saying what? He says, if I was not afraid that my ummah, after I say this particular word, will say about you that you are a god, billah. if I was not afraid of that, I would have said something about you that the people will take from the dust of your feet and your ablution that which they will find blessing in. But it is enough that you are from me and I am from you. And your followers are on pulpits of light and they are my neighbors in the hereafter. That's the hadith I want to start with. What is this thing? What is this secret that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put into Ali ibn Abi Talib? We'll look at this into detail. We'll look at first and foremost a comparison 
to show you the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib with reference to the greats. Because people come forth and say, well, let's look at Ali ibn Abi Talib with reference to the Khalifas. With all due respect, Ali ibn Abi Talib is not a man of this world. Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Khalifas lived in a palace. They lived amongst palaces. Go look at the first, second, and third Khalifa. Go look at all the Abbasid and the Umayyad Khalifas. Look at the palaces, the wealth, the hoarding. And look at Ali ibn Abi Talib when he comes back from one of the civil wars. George Ordag, a Christian man, says, I wrote a book based on this particular incident of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, I wrote an entire book. I wanted to study this life of this great man. Because of one story that you heard of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Look at if he comes into the ocean, which is the Ahlul Bayt, which is... What we have about Ali ibn Abi Talib from books and sources and stories of his greatness. He says, one story brought me towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. When I put him in reference to all those that were in positions before him. Ali ibn Abi Talib, remember, if we count it nowadays, most of the people agree that he ruled what's equivalent to 50 states nowadays at his time. He comes back from a civil war. They built him a house or a palace to rule from in Kufa. He says, I won't enter that place. Look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, I won't never enter this place and never rule from this place. Why, Ali, we've spent time, money, hard work. Why will you not enter this place? Why will you not rule from this place? It's not worthy of you. He says, no, that's not the reason. What's the reason, Ali ibn Abi Talib? He says, look at the top. The roof of that palace is higher than that or more elevated than that roof of the poor people. Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's why when people would be in the streets and the marketplace and Ali ibn Abi Talib would give a particular act or help a particular person, people won't know it would, would be Ali ibn Abi Talib. When he finds the old lady, and it's mentioned in Nahj al-Balagha, one of the first stories mentioned in Nahj al-Balagha, when Ali ibn Abi Talib finds a woman in the marketplace, an elderly woman with an arched back, he helps her to her house and he says, what's the problem? And she says, it's all because of Ali that I'm in this state. She doesn't know it's Ali because the kings of the time, the khulafa of the time never used to be with the people. They never used to be in the marketplace. They weren't seen by the general public. Ali ibn Talib would be in the marketplace. He helps the lady all the way back to her house. And he says, I want to make the bread for you. Do you want to make the bread? And I'll go on the tanur, which is the oven nowadays. She says, it's too hot for me and I'm an elderly lady. In this staunching sun, I'll make the bread. You can put it into the oven, into the tanur. Ali ibn Abi Talib is making the bread. The heat would hit Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he has the line, he says, feel the heat, O oh Ali. Dhuq ya Ali. He says, this is what the people will face if they forget the widows and the orphans. A woman comes in that particular point and she goes to the owner of the house. She says, "How may Allah blacken, as our terminology is found to translators, may Allah blacken your face. She says, why? He says, why is Ali ibn Abi Talib near your oven baking for you? She says, that's Ali ibn Abi Talib. She says, that's Ali ibn Abi Talib. What Khalifa before or after till now does that? What Khalifa? Let's look at this great man. What made him great? In the battlefield, he lifts a door that 40 people can't lift. But when he wants to break her bread, he finds it very hard and he struggles. He's asked, why you lifted the door of Khaybar? You can't break a barley bread. He says, Khaybar was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This barley bread is for Ali. That, that's the great man. In comparison, people are asked throughout history, the comparison, because we realize now that he's a great man. You can't compare him with any Tom, Dick and Harry. We need to... Compare him with the greats in history. We need to compare him with Adam, Sulaiman, Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa. That's the people you need to compare Ali ibn Abi Talib to. And the comparisons are there. We'll go into them now. First and foremost, he's compared to Adam. He says, who is he, who's greater, Adam or Ali ibn Abi Talib? And you will, you will realize within history that the imams have a particular way in which they... Develop your intellect, allow you to think for yourself. And the example is in the Abbasid courtroom between, between Imam al Sadiq 
And between Abu Hanifa, there was a debate and dialogue. Imam asks Abu Hanifa, says, how do you give these fatwas or these rulings without studying? What kind of source of knowledge do you have? He says, I've studied two years under you and now I've gained an aspect in which I can preach. He says, okay, let me ask you, what are you strong in? He says, I'm strong in Nijasa and Tahara. So he asks him, questions, there's many, but I'll just give you the first example. He says, Nijasa and Tahara. And the Imam asks him, he says, what's more impure? He says, urine or semen, what's more impure? So the Abu Hanifa quickly says, well, urine is much more impure. Straight away, he says, are you sure? He says, yes. The Imam doesn't answer him. He makes him think. He says, if urine is more impure, why is it that when it leaves the body, you only wash that particular body part? When semen is released, you wash an entire body. So Abu Hanifa is thinking to himself. No, ask me about the pillars of Islam. Then he asks me, so not a problem. The pillars, what's more in the eyes of Allah at a higher rank? Salah or Siyam? He says, well, Salah is much higher than Siyam. He says, okay. He says, why is it that the woman, when they're in their cycles, they don't have to repeat their Salah, but they have to repeat their Siyam? So Hanif is thinking to himself, I'm not quite sure anymore. He answers by another question, making him think. Abu Hanifa is thinking, I have no idea what's the importance, what's going on. I don't know anything whatsoever. Ali ibn Talib has the same aspect. He makes us think. When he's compared to Adam, he says, Adam ate from a tree which he was not supposed to or was advised against. He says, me for Ali ibn Abi Talib, as for me, he says, that which Allah has made halal for me, I stay away from. That's the first comparison. And we're given that comparison, and when? The last night of Ali ibn Abi Talib's life, which we commemorated two nights ago, when he goes to what narration says is Umm Kulthum, it could be another name for Zainab al-Kubra, she offers him three particular food types. He says, what are you doing? Do you want me to go towards my Lord with a full stomach? What did she offer him? Salt, some milk, and a bread. He says, do you want me to go to my Lord in a full stomach? That which Allah has made halal, I stay away from. And the second comparison, and there's many, but I need to cut it short, inshallah, to look at Allah's greatest name. In the second comparison, he's compared to Sulaiman. And as we know, Sulaiman had the greatest kingdom. He said, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the greatest kingdom. Sulaiman's kingdom, he had ruling over the jinn, the ins, the wind. He could talk any sort of dialect with any animal, you just have to open the Qur'an and read for yourselves. We have to read for ourselves. He used to talk to any dialect. We have a whole surah based on an incident that happened between Sulaiman and an ant. Go look at it, Surah an naml Chapter 27 of the Qur'an. Look at it. Sulaiman had a kingdom like no other. Ali ibn Abi Talib is narrated to have said, Ya dunya talaktuki thalath la raj'atali. He says, this dunya that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created and all its beauties and bounties I have divorced three times. I don't want it. I don't want a kingdom. I don't want this dunya. When he's asked Ali ibn Abi Talib in reference to this dunya, he says, would you rather be here or in heaven? He says, I'd only rather be here for one aspect. It's when I'm here praying to Allah, Allah is happy with me. Whereas I, if I am in heaven, I am happy with myself. That's the aspect of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Another comparison. He says, Musa, and we recited that yesterday, that Surah to Tawbah, ninth, cha ninth chapter in the Quran, the Prophet gave to Ali ibn Abi Talib as himself to reveal to Quraysh. He says, Musa killed one person from his tribe and he was afraid to go back. He says, Ali ibn Abi Talib killed not, not only one person, he says, not a household in Quraysh, except they were mourning because of someone that Ali ibn Abi Talib killed in their family. He says, however, I did not hesitate for one second to go back to Quraysh and reveal this chapter of the Holy Quran. And this is where it gets interesting. Then he goes, how about Isa? Isa, Ruh Allah. Isa is the one that could walk on water. Isa is the one that made a sculpture out of bird out of clay, and he blew on it and it became a bird. Isa, surely, Ali ibn Abi Talib, you can't compare him to Isa. He says, Isa, you look at his mother, Maryam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, what does he say? 
gets out of the holy land to give birth to Isa. He says, look at the comparison with Ali ibn Abi Talib, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say to my mother to go out of the holy land. He's told my mother, here is my house, the Kaaba, and I will open it for you to give birth to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salawat. Then he is compared with our Prophet and he says, Ana Abdun min Abidi Muhammad. So who is this man? What greatness does he have? What power is entrusted in him? Now let's look at it in comparison and in reference to Ismullah al A'zam. Allah's greatest name. What do we know about it? Allah's greatest name remains a secret to many people. It consists of 73 letters. These 73 letters, if a person has one, do you know what he's capable of? In Surah An-Naml, in Surah An-Naml, we read, when Sulaiman says, I need someone to bring me the throne of Balqis. What do we know about it? One of the jinn stands up, and he says to Sulaiman, I will bring it for you before you stand from your place or before you stand from where you are sitting and you will find me on this aspect to be strong and loyal then the next verse that was that was verse 39 verse 40 this is where it gets very very interesting then it verse 40 says one of the people that were there that had knowledge from the book. Remember, look at the terminology. He had knowledge from the book, not of the book. Knowledge from the book. What does he say? I will bring you the throne. In narrations, it wasn't just a throne like this. Not like a pulpit. In narrations, it says, and the sheikh went through it a couple of nights ago. The throne, it was referring to her entire palace in which her throne stood on top of the palace. Because they used to worship the sun, and it would be open so the sun would come inside. Where she would worship what she believed Allah was. He says, I will bring you the throne. Before you blink, this eyelid, before it comes back. I will bring you the throne. What kind of power must he have? It's in the Quran. It's not something that we can believe or not believe. It's the Quran, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He had what in our narrations? The prophets asked, how much letters of Allah's greatest name did this person have? He said he had one letter of Allah's greatest name is able to produce that particular miracle. Let's look at the prophets. How many did they have? Asa, walk on water, resurrect the dead, give the blind their eyesight back. Make a clay statue of a bird, blow on it and becomes a real bird. Bi'idhnillah. Remember, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He had two letters. Two letters of Allah's greatest name. Musa split the sea. His stick becomes a snake. A thuban. Musa with his miracles against the magicians of the time. Three of Allah's greatest names. Ibrahim attained rank upon rank upon rank until he was given the rank of Imamat. He had eight. Eight of Allah's greatest names. Look at what he was capable of. Imam al-Baqir says in reference to our Prophet, he says he had 72 out of 73 letters of Allah's greatest name. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. When he used to make miracles and perform miracles, people would come forth and say, you're a magician. If he doesn't perform miracles, he says, you're, you're not a real messenger. What do you do? What do you do then? Look at nowadays. We have intellect, not miracles. We're not showing miracles. We have intellect. We tell them, this is the path. This is logic. What do they call us? Don't talk to a follower of Ahlul Bayt because they're magicians. They will magically turn your head towards Ahlul Bayt. Magically turn your head towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. 
Well, the Prophet 1400 years ago, he was called the same thing, magician. Nowadays, people go towards their workplaces and they don't say anything. On an, on an actual account, a person said, just ask your sheikh. You don't want to hear it from me. Ask your sheikh of the Battle of Jamal. He goes to his sheikh, he says, sheikh, you know, I've... I know you told us not to talk towards the followers of Ahlul Bayt, but one of them asked me a question. He says, can you tell me about the battle of Jamal? What's Jamal? What's going on? He says, Jamal, you've been talking to a Shia, haven't you? What, what do you say? Where do you start? That's the oppression. Every level. Every level. Going back, Imam al-Baqir says this about the Prophet of Islam. And what do we know about the Prophet saying, he says, Ana Madinatul Ilm Aliyun. I am the city of knowledge, and Ali is its gate. Ali ibn Abi Talib says what? He says, Alamani Rasulullah Alpha Bab. Tuftah min kulli babin. Alpha Bab. One thousand doors of knowledge the Prophet has taught me. And from those thousand, one thousand others are open. Imam al Baqir also says what? He says, those 72 letters that the Prophet had, he passed on to who? Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's the status of Ali. When we read the miracles of Ali ibn Abi Talib, honestly, I had an, a book open late, uh, earlier today. I'm reading the miracles. I'm thinking to myself, I can't say this on the pulpit. I need background before I say this. Because the Prophet, what does he say? If I say this, people will say about you, oh, Ali... Like the Christian said about Jesus, son of Mary, but if I put it into context, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Hadith Qudsi, O oh my servant, obey me like the way I have instructed. I will allow you to be like me, in which I say to the thing, Kun, Fayakun. If you obey me in that instance, I will allow you to say to the thing, Be, and it will be. So miracles of Ali ibn Talib, when we read that he returned the sun twice, when we read of the miracles of Ali ibn Abi Talib, in Saluni Qabla and Tafqiduni, some some things honestly make your hair go white and you think to yourself, this is unimaginable. The Prophet of Islam, he goes to Ma'raj. Look at this narration, brothers and sisters. He goes to the Ma'raj. And when he is next to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, next to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib. In the narration, it states that obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can't have a voice because we'll be objectifying Allah. Allah can't be objectified, that's kufr. Therefore, Allah has to create a voice, doesn't he? He can create a voice in which he can speak to the Prophet. In. Likewise, he creates a voice when Musa spoke to him in the tree. Now, the comparison we gave two nights ago between Harun. And Ali ibn Abi Talib was what? You are like, you are to me like Aaron was to Moses. Ante minni bi manzilati Harun min Musa. That's a comparison that we have. When Musa was talking into the, in the tree with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah creates a voice. What voice was it? It was Harun's. God, why have you created Harun's voice to talk to me? And he goes, that voice gives you serenity, gives you an ease. Likewise, when the Prophet went on Mi'raj, he heard the voice of Ali ibn Abi Talib. I've had the signal, so I have to end on that note, brothers and sisters. But inshallah, we'll continue with the miracles tomorrow. We'll look in more depth into who Ali ibn Abi Talib is, the miracles of Ali ibn Abi Talib. When we go to Kufa, we realize that he spoke with the Thu'ban when it comes into the Masjid of Kufa and a whole door is called Bab al Thu'ban because there was a jinn that came to Ali ibn Abi Talib in front of everyone and it's recorded in history that the jinn talked to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib, Saluni an qabla an tafqiduni. It's narrated and it's narrated in numerous other books. Hashim al-Bahrani's book, it's narrated, that I just read today. A person in the crowd, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and I end on this note, just to show you the greatness and the sight of Ali ibn Abi Talib and what power that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusted in this man. And I end on this. A person sitting in the majlis like this, in Kufa, Ali ibn Abi Talib on the pulpit, he says, Saluni qabla an tafqiduni. Ask me before you lose me. A person gets up. He says, I want to ask you, where is Jibra'il? 
So the people think to himself, Ali ibn Talib is going to answer this. The narration says, Ali ibn Talib looks towards the earth for moments. Then he puts his head up. He looks towards the right hand side for moments. Then he comes back, looks towards the left hand side. Moments, then he looks up for an extended time period. Then he looks straight at the man that asked him and he says, you are Jibra'il, in which the narration states that a light beam expanded, two wings were formed and Jibra'il flew out of the ceiling. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. That's, that's the smallest miracle I can mention. That's the smallest that people went be hesitant or ask about. Inshallah, we end on this note. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us on the Iman, strengthen us on this path as we commemorate our Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib on this tragic, tragic occasion of his martyrdom. We ask Allah and we thank Allah that he has made us firm on this path, made us firm on the wilaya of Ali ibn Abi Talib and we pray to Allah that he accepts our prayers on this holy night, accepts our a'mal on this holy night and the a'mal of the mu'mineen and the mu'minat everywhere around the world. Bibarakatil Surat al Mubarakatil Fatiha Tasbiqaha three of your loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.